My investing strategy is simple. I buy really good companies and I hold them for a long period of time. I've done this with a number of companies, one of them being Costco. I first started buying Costco back in 2017. The share price at the time was $186. Costco's price since then has over doubled, up to $556. And I've made over $11,000 in this position while continually adding to it over the years. Costco, after all, is a really good company, and I'll continue to hold it so long as it remains a really good company. Another really good company that I've held for a really long period of time is in the tech category. Both Apple and Microsoft have widely outperformed the market over the past five years, and having the strategy of buying these good companies and holding them long term has been a market beating strategy. The challenge of course for us investors is identifying good companies early on, distinguishing between good companies and bad companies, and knowing whether a good company is still good. So what I plan on doing in this episode is going over the qualities of a good company, one that stands out from the rest. But instead of looking at Apple and Microsoft or Costco, today we're gonna to be looking at another company called S&P Global. This one is less understood by retail investors. A lot of retail investors clamor to stocks like Tesla, Palantir, Companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Nvidia. While these companies get the most attention, there's other incredible tech companies that should be in the same conversation, S&P Global being one of them. S&P Global is a highly scaled tech and data company. What I hope to do today is to highlight the overall business model and why I believe this company is extraordinarily good and why I've made it my single largest holding in my portfolio. Now, of course, we also have some breaking news that we'll be getting to in this episode as well. The FTC is officially suing Amazon, alleging an online marketplace monopoly. We finally have the real details, not the rumors, but the real details from the FTC. So we'll be going over this case, looking at it from the perspective of the FTC. Now let's go ahead and start off with a look at my single largest holding in my portfolio. That is S&P Global. Like I highlighted, I'm looking for high quality companies that I can hold for a long period of time. Finding really good companies, ones that stand the test of time, is difficult. But I believe we can do it with enough studying of the company's history. They have common characteristics. I've highlighted these common characteristics on different spreadsheets, things that I wanna look for in companies, including strong organic growth, pricing power, scalability, predictability in their cash flows and earnings, and monopolistic traits. These are qualitative aspects of a good company. And generally speaking, if a company has all of these traits, it's gonna be pretty good. But for a company to have all of these traits, they need to have a good business model. They need to have a good product. And S&P Global is one of these tech companies that has a very misunderstood product. S&P Global is one of those companies that 99% of people have no clue what it does at all. And the people that do typically only have a vague understanding of what this company actually does. It is a company that's difficult to understand until you really dive in deep. And that's what I've done. So let's go ahead and first start off with the various businesses of S&P Global. The way to think of S&P Global most accurately is that it's the world's leading market data business. They provide market data through five major segments. So it's like a basket of five different companies under the name S&P Global. So we have five different businesses under this name here. Let's go ahead and go through the first one. The now largest segment under S&P Global is called market intelligence. This makes up for around 32% of their overall revenue. This segment includes huge products like S&P Capital IQ. This is a product that competes with Bloomberg Terminal. So consider this S&P Global's version of a Bloomberg Terminal. This is a cornucopia of data. It has data in the financial markets for fundamental data, credit analytics, supply chain, regulatory, private market, and sustainability. They already have a massive wealth in data, a huge advantage in this category with already the biggest data set of any company, but they're also constantly updating their data and they sell it to a diversified base of customers. Their customers include banks, investment management services, corporations, insurance agencies, private equity, professional investors, governments, academia, and so on. We're at a point now where there's an insatiable appetite for data. S&P Global is the largest business in owning and hosting this proprietary data. They license it and they sell it either through bulk packages or subscriptions. This is a reoccurring revenue stream with very high retention, high margins, and ample growth opportunity. It also comes with pricing power. Remember that list of things I looked for in good companies, common characteristics found amongst them, strong organic growth, demonstrated pricing power, and scalability? 
This product has all of them. Data is highly scalable. It comes with pricing power. It has residual billing, meaning that they get a revenue stream that's reliable and predictable. Consumers need data that's both robust, accurate, and from a trusted provider. S&P Global somehow, even after the collapse in 2009, the huge banking crisis, and their brand being diminished and them bungling that event, they've somehow risen from it like a phoenix from the ashes to become the most trusted brand in financial data. Companies that you use, use S&P Global all the time. For example, if you've ever used Yahoo Finance to look at a company, they use S&P Global. All of this information is generated by that company, and they have a long list of clients like these ones that you've probably used yourself. And it's not just brand value that brings customers to S&P Global's data over other competitors. It's the fact that they really do have some of the most validated and trusted data that's the most accurate in the industry. In fact, they're the only one that provides a quality guarantee where they'll literally pay you out money if you find inaccuracies in their data. Now, luckily for S&P Global, being the leader right now is a good time to be the leader because this is a very top heavy industry where typically only a few companies tend to dominate the entire industry. It is what's called a natural monopoly. I believe strongly with the market position S&P Global has already, they'll continue to gain market share over time, not lose it. So the first business of S&P Global, market intelligence, which makes up 32% of revenues, is high growth, high margin, has pricing power, has customers on subscription, or through licensed income. That makes up business number one. Let's go ahead and move on to business number two, the ratings business. Now, while most people remember S&P Global and Moody's during the financial crisis and the way that they bungled the ratings of the mortgage-backed securities, this event, although it's a spectacle and it was a big event, it makes up a very small portion of S&P Global's rating history and their overall rating business. Ratings already is a massive business for this company. The US and the entire world is becoming increasingly driven by credit. In order for large institutions and corporations to invest in debt, it needs to be rated. The current leaders in rating of that debt is Moody's, S&P Global, and Fitch. Combined, they rate over 95% of all the world's debt. The ratings business is a natural monopoly. Because Moody's and S&P Global are the most trusted names, institutions can sell that debt with their ratings a few basis points lower than with the ratings of other services. See, that's the specialty here. They get a few basis points lower when they rate the debt than any other competitor. That's what creates a natural monopoly. Those basis points make for millions of dollars in difference for any sizable amount of debt. Meaning that even if a competitor offered their rating service for free, it would still be cheaper to get your debt rated by S&P Global and Moody's than the competitor, even if the competitors were free. That is an astounding natural monopoly. This self-reinforcing natural monopoly has allowed S&P Global to grow its rating business alongside the ever-growing global debt. And I fully expect this dynamic to continue in the future. As global debts grow, so will the revenue and the margins of the rating business. So S&P Global's second largest business, ratings, which they've been in for decades, is a resilient, high margin business where they have a natural monopoly against all competitors. The only companies that can really compete with them are Moody's, which they've grown in line with for decades. And this is a business that, like the data business, like market intelligence, has long growth and secular trend. Meaning that over time, over the next 10 years, it is more than expected that global debt will increase. Now, the exact magnitude of that increase is debatable, but we know that global debt's going to increase over time. And as it does, S&P Global is uniquely positioned right now to be one of the key players that benefits from that increase in global debt. The ratings business for S&P Global also checks the boxes for quality characteristics in a business. It has pricing power, it's naturally monopolistic, it has predictability and cash flows, strong organic growth and secular trends, and it's highly scalable. Combined, these two businesses, which both are incredibly uniquely attractive businesses with wide moats, make up around 60% of the company's revenue. So we still have around 40% left. It's time to move on to company number three under S&P Global called Commodity Insights. 
This is yet another data business, but this time instead of financial assets and fundamental data, this is data around commodities. Commodities like oil, upstream, LNG, natural gas, electric power, coal, shipping, petrochemicals, metal, agriculture, so on and so forth. They cover basically every commodity. And then furthermore, they have proprietary ways of gathering this data. And then they package this data together. They sell it either through a subscription or through bulk contract licensing. So it is a highly reliable stream of income. Similar to the market intelligence data, this data is being used all the time. See all those tickers going across the bottom of CNBC? They have pricing for different companies and then they have commodity pricing like crude oil. All of that data is generated from S&P Global's commodity insight business. Now, the great part about this business is even though the underlying commodities like crude oil is unpredictable and volatile, selling data and measuring the price of these commodities is very predictable. So the underlying thing that they're measuring is unpredictable, but the business they have layered upon it is highly predictable. S&P Global uses these type of commodities to layer upon a bunch of different services, and they sell it through either subscription or bulk data sets sold through contract. Either way, it makes up another high margin, reoccurring revenue stream that's also highly predictable. When I cross through this individual business through the checklist of what I typically look for, it again checks the boxes. It does have strong secular trend growth over time as a history of demonstrated pricing power. It's data that's highly scalable and it's very predictable. So the third business of S&P Global, making up 15% of their revenue, is yet another great business under the name of this company. So far, I like everything I see with this company, but let's go ahead and move on to business number four. This makes up just under 10% of their overall revenue, and this business is called Mobility. Now, you know me, I don't invest in car companies. A lot of people have asked why I don't invest in Tesla, and that's because I'm unsure of the overall industry. I don't like the fact that their primary form of making revenue is through selling cars. Car companies have a long history of giving suboptimal returns. So we look at business number four here, and we see that it's in mobility. They're talking primarily about cars. This is a car portion of the company. But as you may have guessed, S&P Global does not sell cars. Instead, this company sells yes, more data, more and more data. That's what this company does best. They supply key mobility data to suppliers, OEMs, dealers, government, and customers. They own a ton of data around production planning, marketing and sales, and aftermarket. Everything that you can do in the car industry, where you might need data around the industry, S&P Global's there is a trusted data provider. They're not picking sides in the war over data, they're being the supplier. They do it in the market intelligence business, they do it in the ratings business, they do it in the commodity insights business, and they do the same exact thing in the mobility business. It is no different than the rest. They found a formula that works and they've replicated it across verticals to basically every single market. That is what this company does. They own market data. Now we move on to the fifth and final business under the S&P Global name. Around 10% of their revenue comes from the indices business. Now you may be familiar with this one, or you may at least have noticed that S&P Global shares part of the name with the S&P 500. An index in and of itself is a simple context in the financial realm. It can be used to track the performance of a group of assets in a standardized way. This is exactly why people say you should index your money. You're basically putting it into one of these products that tracks the performance of a group of assets. An ETF is simply a package to follow an index. But anytime someone creates an ETF based on another index, they have to pay a fee for doing that. The fees for using the index, using the data from it, or benchmarking against it, of course, go towards the owner of the index. They're the ones that collects these fees. And S&P Global so happens to be one of the largest indexing businesses in the world. They have thousands of indexes across US equity, global equity, developed equity, emerging equity, and frontier equity. They have hundreds of fixed income indices with composite global bonds, treasury, inflation-linked bonds, municipal bonds, money market, corporate bonds, thematic, collateralized, preferable, and convertible. They have indices focused on different factors and themes, smart beta indices, ones like the dividend aristocrats. They're the ones that created that, the dividend opportunities, select dividend funds. They're the ones that created the SCHD fund that's so popular amongst social media. 
The great thing about the indice business is that it's what's called passive investing, meaning that you're just putting your money into an ETF and letting that handle everything. You're not buying actively managed funds, you're not buying individual companies, you're not buying mutual funds. This trend of passive investing has long-term secular growth trends that rival any secular growth trends in the market. It's one of the most proven secular growth trends in the world. From a recent research report from PWL Capital specific to Canada, they say recording multi-year trends, the net flows into passive funds has been positive every year since 2013, with total inflows of $144 billion over the past 10 years. Over that same period, the money flow into active funds was only $127 billion. This is the first time we have ever recorded a higher 10-year inflow for Canada passive funds compared to active funds. Investors are moving away from active into passive. Now, those numbers are specific to Canada, but even when we go outside of Canada to the broader market, it's the same exact trend. From Bloomberg's market intelligence, they say passive is likely to overtake active by 2026, earlier if we go into a bear market. Now, I apologize that the image is a bit lower resolution, but it still illustrates clearly the point being made here. This is a comparison of actively managed funds against passively managed, and this is within the US, not Canada. We have here in blue, actively managed funds. And then in white, we have passive managed funds. Notice how over time, actively managed funds is barely growing. It's basically remaining the same. And then in white, the passively managed funds is growing dramatically. This is the trend analysis they're looking at. So we know the trends are clear. More money's going into passive investing over time. The lower fees and broader diversification and more reliable returns make it a better choice for the majority of investors. Now, like in the rest of these categories, this is a very top heavy industry. Most of the passive investing money will flow into the top ETFs. Principal among them is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 already has over $7 trillion linked to this index. As more of this linking occurs over time, which it will, Bill, that'll be more money that S&P Global collects in fees. And there we have the fifth and final business of S&P Global, the indice business. When I look at it and contrast it against the qualities that I look for, it has all the same qualities. Strong organic growth trends over time. This is secular growth. They have demonstrated pricing power. You can't really compete with them. It has very top heavy monopolistic characteristics. It's highly scalable and it has very high margins. When I look over all of these businesses, I notice that they all have something in common. They're all about markets. The market may be global credit, equity, fixed income, commodity, mobility, or indices. Either way, they're about markets. If you believe markets in general are going to grow over time, this company is well positioned to be a dominant player to extract value out of the growth of markets. So just from a basic business fundamental aspect, I like the businesses S&P Global's in. But that's not the only aspect of this company. There's also the financial aspect of this business. S&P Global possesses incredibly attractive financial characteristics. To look at some of these characteristics, I wanna be using a platform called Qualtrim. This is part of the Patreon membership. And this allows us to see visually why I believe this is a good company. There's one metric that Buffett always looks at with his companies, and he calls this high returns on tangible assets. High returns on tangible assets is something that Buffett loves. Now, I'm not gonna be looking at that exact metric, but there's one that basically measures the same thing, the same principle, and that is return on capital employed. This is also very similar to returns on invested capital. These different things are ways of measuring what type of returns the business gets with the capital and with the assets it has. With returns on capital employed, you're saying if I give this company X amount of money, what type of returns are they going to generate with that money? And S&P Global has a long history of consistently high returns on capital employed. Out of all the financial characteristics to find attractive, this is principal amongst them. It's the one that Terry Smith mentions. It's the one that Dev Kentasaria mentions. It's the one that Warren Buffett mentions. All the great investors look for this primary attribute, returns on capital employed, returns on invested capital, 
returns on tangible assets. Getting these numbers very high is very difficult, and S&P Global has these numbers high. Now, returns on capital employed are important, but we also have gross margins. S&P Global has a long history of high gross margins. We also have the operating margins of the business. Again, this is trending up over time, only falling because of a recent merger, which is a one-off event. The inherent nature of the data business is that it has high margins across the board, including profit margins. This company has profit margins that are growing over over time and remain consistently high. The leverage that they have in their business, the fact that it's data and highly scalable, and the fact that it's a wide moat industry makes it so that they can maintain this frankly ridiculous standard of 30% profit margins. Not many businesses are able to do this. This is in the leagues of Meta, the advertising business. This is one that's looked at because of its profit margins, and S&P Global has as consistently or higher profit margins than Meta. This is also in the same realm as Microsoft, right around the same range. Only a select few of elite companies are able to have profit margins consistently above 30%. So we have a business that has consistently high returns across the board. Whether you're measuring that by returns on tangible assets, return on invested capital, whether you're measuring that by the gross operating or profit margins of the company, all of those are much higher than the average company. Another metric that we always pay attention to is the cash flow of the company. Does this company generate consistent and growing cash flows? The clear answer to that is yes. Now, of course, S&P Global had a pretty high spike in 2021. It's fallen a little bit in 2022 because a lot of companies decided not to issue more debt, but that is an entirely temporary phenomenon. In 2023, S&P Global is expected to have $4.3 billion in free cash flow, which would be an all-time high in cash flow and consistent with their long-term trend. So overall, this is a very cash flow generative business. They're cash flow generative because they don't have much in terms of expense. It's highly efficient with a low stock-based comp, much lower than companies like Meta or Google or Amazon or Microsoft or Apple. It beats out all of them in efficiencies. They also have almost no capex, less than $100 million. This is basically their spend on AWS servers. They offload that off to different companies to keep themselves capital light. Because they're capital light, they pay both a fast growing dividend that's been growing for literally 50 years and they return capital through buybacks. Now there was a bump up in share count because of the acquisition, but that is a one-off event. Now that they're growing organically and integrating IHS market into the rest of their company, you'll see the share count go down steadily over time. And in terms of valuation, with $4.3 billion in free cash flow in 2023, with a market cap of $118 billion, S&P Global is being valued around 3.4% free cash flow yield. That is the current valuation, which is very similar to the S&P 500, meaning that investors are currently pricing this company with the same level of risk and future growth assumptions as the rest of the S&P 500. And my view is that S&P Global is a much better company than the aggregated weighted average of the S&P 500. And I believe just like I did with Apple and Microsoft and Costco five years ago, that these companies would beat the market. I believe the same will happen with S&P Global. I think the company's gonna beat the market. And that's why I purchased nearly $70,000 of the company. Now, I don't highlight this to try to sell the company to you or have you invest in it. It's a large enough market cap that that doesn't really make a difference. The reason that I highlight my investment thesis here is to show that it's important to have some type of knowledge about the company you're investing in and to have a sound thesis, to not buy large amounts of companies like this without doing adequate research. And there is always a chance that things don't work out as expected. The S&P Global runs into some problem. Maybe there's some unknown force or competition that comes into play. There's things that could cause it to underperform. But given the qualities of the business, that's a risk I'm willing to take. So S&P Global is yet another good company that I plan on holding for a long time. Now, if you like seeing these type of in-depth highlights and real research on companies, make sure you subscribe to the channel and I'll have more in the future. I plan on doing this from time to time with different companies I'm looking at or ones in my portfolio. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to some news. The FTC is suing Amazon, alleging that they're an online marketplace monopoly. That's not the only thing they're alleging. They're alleging a lot in this lawsuit. The shares are down over 4% today. 
So Amazon in and of itself has always been a volatile stock, but this news has not helped out the stock. So investors are concerned about this lawsuit, as they should be. This is a massive, momentous lawsuit led by Lena Khan, who has had a chip on her shoulder against Amazon literally since she was in college. In fact, part of the reason she's even in the role she is is because of her literal hatred towards big tech and their so-called skirting of these laws. So they say the FTC sues Amazon for illegally maintaining monopoly power, alleging that the online retail and technology company is a monopolist that uses a set of interlocking anti-competitive and unfair strategies to illegally maintain its monopoly power. The FTC and its state partners say that Amazon's actions allow it to stop rivals and sellers from lowering prices. They degrade quality for shoppers, overcharging sellers, stifle innovation, and prevent rivals from fairly competing against Amazon. The complaint alleges that Amazon violates the law not because it's big, but because it engages in a course of exclusionary conduct that prevents current competitors from growing and new competitors from emerging. By stifling competition on price, product selection, quality, and by preventing its customers or future rivals from attracting a critical mass of shoppers and sellers, Amazon ensures that no current or future rival can threaten its dominance. Amazon's far-reaching schemes impact hundreds of billions of dollars in retail sales every year, touch hundreds of thousands of products sold by businesses, big and small, and affect over hundreds of millions of shoppers. Our complaint lays out how Amazon has used its set of punitive and coercive tactics to unlawfully maintain its monopolies. This is Lena Khan, quote, the complaint sets forth detailed allegations, noting how Amazon is now exploiting its monopoly power to enrich itself while raising prices and degrading services for tens of millions of Americans, families who shop on its platform, and the hundreds of thousands of businesses that rely on Amazon to reach them. Today's lawsuit seeks to hold Amazon to account for these monopolistic practices and to restore the lost promise of free and fair competition. They really are, they're painting Amazon as a really bad company. When I read this, I think, wow, Amazon must be a horrible company for customers, for competition. It's just this, this horrible, profiting, plundering company that's living off the fat of the land. That's the way that Amazon's being portrayed. We're bringing this case because Amazon's illegal conduct has stifled competition across a huge swath of the online economy. Amazon is a monopolist that uses its power to hike prices on American shoppers and charge sky-high fees on hundreds of thousands of online sellers. Seldom in the history of the US has antitrust law has one case had the potential to do so much good for so many people. The FTC and state alleges that Amazon's anti-competitive conduct occurs in two markets, the online superstore market that serves shoppers and the market for online marketplace services purchased by sellers. These tactics include, this is where we get into the specific things they're complaining about Amazon, anti-discounting measures that punish sellers and deter other online retailers from shopping and offering lower prices on Amazon, keeping prices higher for products across the internet. For example, if Amazon discovers that a seller is offering a lower priced goods elsewhere, Amazon can bury discounting sellers so far down in Amazon search results that they become effectively invisible. Conditioning seller's ability to obtain prime eligibility for their products, a virtual necessity for doing business on Amazon. On sellers using Amazon's costly fulfillment service, which has made it substantially more expensive for sellers on Amazon to also offer their products on Amazon platforms, this unlawful coercion has in turn limited competitors' ability to effectively compete against Amazon. So we have two very specific complaints there. I'll address these ones later. Amazon's illegal, exclusionary conduct makes it impossible for competitors to gain a foothold. With its amassed power across both online superstore market and online marketplace services market, Amazon extracts enormous monopoly rents from everyone within its reach. This includes degrading the customer experience by replacing relevant organic search results with paid advertisement, and deliberately increasing junk ads that worsen search quality and frustrate both shoppers seeking products and sellers who are promised a return on their advertising purchase, biasing Amazon search results to preference Amazon's own products over ones that Amazon knows are better quality, 
charging costly fees on the hundreds of thousands of sellers that currently have no choice but to rely on Amazon to stay in business. These fees range from a monthly fee sellers must pay for each item sold to advertising fees that have become virtually necessary for the seller to do business. Combined, all these fees force many sellers to pay close to 50% of their total revenues to Amazon. These fees harm not only sellers, but also shoppers who pay increased prices for thousands of products sold on Amazon. The FTC, along with state partners, are seeking a permanent injunction in the federal court that would prohibit Amazon from engaging in its unlawful conduct and to pry loose Amazon's monopolistic control and restore competition. That's just the outline of it. They have other things they complain about as well. Now, I'm not going to go through every section of this, but I just want to highlight a couple things in terms of their claims on the specific actions Amazon is taking. When I was reading through this, what I noticed was that the FTC is basically taking a lot of completely normal business practices, they're stating a normal business practice, and then they're acting incredulous, like it's a terrible thing to do, or it's illegal. What they're stating is not illegal. Anti-discounting measures are not illegal. And having distribution agreements, exclusivity agreements is entirely normal in the marketplace. This is something that businesses do day in and day out. So when they say that Amazon has anti-discounting measures where they'll punish sellers that offer the same product on Amazon for a higher price than they do on a different competing website, that is not only completely standard business practice and well within Amazon's ability to do, but every other company on planet Earth has the same ability to do that. Netflix and Warner Brothers Discovery and Disney have exclusive right offerings to different shows. They might say that if you offer the show with us, you can't with Netflix or you can't with Warner Brothers Discovery. They can make exclusive agreements or anti-discounting agreements. So the FTC's argument here is that this is okay when any other company does this, but when Amazon does this, it's bad. Conditioning sellers is another way of phrasing something that's completely standard business practice. You can give incentive to use certain products you sell for sellers. Every company does this, including Shopify, including every online retailer. They give you specific incentives for using a product. Proving that this is unlawful coercion, I think is gonna be a very difficult task. Now this part where they complain about the seller services I think is particularly amusing. They say here that they're degrading the customer experience by replacing relevant organic search results with paid advertisements. So basically, Amazon is a bad company because instead of just showing you the search results, they put ads in front of those search results, therefore degrading your experience. Now let's think about this for a minute. What other company puts ads in front of you before you get a view a product? therefore degrading the experience. Well, all television does that, all of network television, all of cable TV television, every streaming service does that, YouTube does that, Google search does that, Meta's Facebook does that, Instagram does that. Every product that has eyes, every single one of them in the world that's at large scale and has people shopping or visiting has advertising. So saying that Amazon is degrading the user experience by introducing ads in front of search results again, goes along with literally every other business in the business world. This is in line with the FTC stating something that is standard business practice, but because Amazon's doing it, it's somehow bad. Biasing Amazon search results for preferences of Amazon's own products over ones that Amazon knows are better quality. How are they gonna gauge quality of these items? Are they gonna do it by the Amazon review or feedback when they're simultaneously arguing that Amazon can't be trusted? Presumably the reviews can't be trusted? They have no objective way to measure quality here. Many of Amazon basic items are much lower priced than other name brand items. If you buy Amazon basic batteries, for example, they're cheaper than Duracell and they typically have the same quality. So this is another case where it's either opinionated or unprovable. Charging costly fees on hundreds of thousands of sellers that currently have no choice but to rely on Amazon to stay in business. This is where they paint Amazon as this company that's plundering and profiting off of the fat of the land. Combined, all of these fees force many sellers to pay up to 50% of their total revenues to Amazon. They're charging fees because it's the only way they can pay for their extensive infrastructure investment. Amazon is the one that put in $70 billion in CapEx over the past two years. Amazon is the one that built the entire infrastructure, the seller services, built all of the warehouse, the logistics, all of the trucks. They're the ones that created all of this infrastructure. 
charging 50% throughout various fees as a payment for using their services, for building your business off of the backs of Amazon's infrastructure. And 50% is not exactly a high fee for the services they render. Apple's charging 30%, for app stores, which has significantly less capital expenditure. Google through YouTube takes 45% of ad revenue, almost 50%, and with video shorts, they take 55%. Meta through Facebook and Instagram as well take over 50%. All of these companies take around that much. Highlighting yet again, this is another case where the FTC says something as though it's bad, even though it's general business practice, and the only reason it's bad is because Amazon's doing it. There's a lot of assumptions right in the headline of this case that are near impossible to prove. Amazon is inflating prices. The entire business model of Amazon, for anyone that studied the stock, is they try to keep prices as low as possible. As low as possible for customers. That is their competitive moat, having very low margins. Degrading quality is incredibly subjective. Measuring quality from one product to another is difficult. When I measure the quality of Amazon, I measure it in terms of the convenience, which it's incredibly convenient. I measure it in terms of the quality of the product, which in most cases, it's good quality products, especially compared to competitors like the Chinese flea market company, Timu. That is a company that has degraded quality. The claim that Amazon's stifling innovation. Innovation has sped up over the past five years. It has not slowed down. If Amazon is stifling innovation, they're not doing a good job at it. So we'll see where this case goes in the future, but this is what we know right now. And my opinion of this overall has not changed. I think the FTC has a very difficult case cut out for them. That's gonna be it for this episode. If you want more content, make sure to check out the Patreon. Other than that, I'll see you in the next one.